Uh, welcome everyone to the ninth skin walk tonight with Conor McGarrigal taking <coughs> over the screen. Uh, my name is uh, John Uriarte, I'm creator of digital programs at the Photographers Gallery in London. Uh, skin Walks is a collaborative program by the Photographers Gallery and for the Museum Winter Tour in Switzerland that has received support from Prodretia. And this Skin Walk in particular is a collaboration with uh, Photo Island Festival 2020. Skinworks is a fortnightly series of live stream events aimed to offer an open access to the spaces where the core artistic practice of our invited artists takes place. Practitioners, creators, researchers who are actively investigating or pushing forward notions of photography and the network image are invited, invited to share the knowledge and work process with us. Each event has a very fluid format that can sit in between a performance, a lecture, a workshop and a conversation. Uh, we offer the possibility to sneak over the shoulder of our guests and interact with them while they share the knowledge and their contents that they have on their desktops. For those uh, of you in Zoom, uh, your microphone should be muted. If not, please go ahead and mute it now. If you have any questions, you can send them to me or to Marco through a private message in our public chat. And uh, remember that this uh, event is being recorded and will be archived. So please don't activate your camera if you don't want to be recorded. If this is your first skin work, just let me remind you that all of our previous events are available on our website, skinworks.com, as well as in our uh, YouTube channel and Twitch channels. And hello from my side too. My name is Marco Demutis and I work as digital curator at Photo Museum Winter Tour. Let me join uh, John also in uh, thanking um, Photo Ireland Festival 2020 for this collaboration and also for the support of Pro Helvetia to our series. In our Screenwalk series, we have already followed artists and researchers on different platforms and spaces, exploring the different properties of digital and network images and the different roles and forms that the photographic can have in contemporary visual culture. We have chased images on Craigslist and eBay, in computer games and virtual worlds, even on Cuban hard disks and marketplaces for dating apps. So all of these platforms and spaces are very important for us as we believe that they are not neutral places of exchange of image production and consumption, but rather they affect the role of the images they host. They also define different models of how we share images and consequently how our roles as photographers and viewers. So the circulation of network images we have seen can be regulated by economies of attention capital, um, or it can foster a creative community and a sense of belonging among its members. Image circulation can be achieved as an alternative peer-to-peer -peer network of exchange or strictly regulated by media services provider. Rich images, poor images, to put it in Hito Steyer's words, um, but also resolutions and compressions, protocols and codecs, formats and visual styles are all tied to different platforms, images, ideologies, and social and cultural implications. So today we are very excited to take a look at not one, but two technologies and spaces that have shaped and affected greatly the role of images in our visual culture in the last 20 years. I'm referred to BitTorrent's peer-to-peer file sharing communication protocol, and the now defunct Vine platform for short video exchange. These technologies lie at the center of two works of Conor McGarrigal's projects, BitTorrent Trilogy and 24 Hour Social, which were separated by a time span of a decade. So expect a screen walk back in time today and perhaps a chance to rethink the ways our network spaces have changed over the years and what that might mean for present and Future media ecology. Um, Conor McGarrigal is an artist and researcher working primarily with digital media. His practice is characterized by urban interventions mediated through digital technologies and data driven explorations of network social practices. He's a lecturer in fine art new media at the TU Dublin School of Creative Arts. Thank you, Conor. The screen is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Marco, and thank you, Photo Ireland Festival, for inviting me. Uh, it is great to be here. I'm very happy to, to, to share this work with you today. Uh, so, uh, as John and Marco said, so what I'm going to do is look at two particular works, uh, and they're separated by a decade. 
the first one is the BitTorrent trilogy, which looks at BitTorrent uh, and the, the whole social practice that goes around BitTorrent of, of, uh, of sharing files, uh, but also what happens at a technical level when, when, when those files are being transmitted and those images are being circulated through the network. Uh, the second project is, is 24 Hour Social, which was this project that downloaded a full day from social media. Uh, and 10 years later, we see that the kind of the landscape of image circulation, the landscape of the network is very, very different already. Uh, and questions of privacy, questions of data, questions of how images are being used and what their currency is uh, come up in this. Uh, so to start and to kind of give uh, a perspective on, on wh wh where this project came from and, wh and what, what was happening at that time, I want to go back to uh, to Napster. And I don't know, tw Napster is, it just had its 20th anniversary. So Napster was this file sharing, it was, it was kind of very much the first file sharing system. It was uh, a way of, of sh sharing mostly music files, uh, it wasn't a peer-to-peer -peer network, it was a very centralized network, but, but what happened was people would share a folder on their computer that had music files in it. It was, strictly speaking, completely illegal. It broke all sorts of copyright rules. Uh, and then what, what it did was it, it also kind of reset the rules of copyright. Certainly things that had been accepted previously uh, such as that, you know, music should be bought, music should be paid for in shops. So they, those rules were kind of changing. Uh, it also corresponded with changes in copyright that came from the digital from digital files and the idea of the digital copy, uh, because previously copyright rules had been made uh, about physical objects, about things like you know records and CDs that you you actually had to have in your possession, and then suddenly you were you were you were able to make copies and share them very quickly. And the idea of the digital copy being a unique object came into play. So Napster started, and we're gonna just start to share my screen now, if I can. I think, yeah, I'll just kind of. So I was actually looking through my hard drives to see I actually had lots of screen captures of Napster from back in the day and I couldn't find any of them. So this is one downloaded off of Wikipedia. Uh, so what Napster did was Napster actually let you into someone's computer. And that was a very interesting thing because uh, it, it, made a file, it made a folder or a series of folders public and people could come into your computer and they could you know, kind of poke around, they could look at what you had. So it very much became this kind of first recommendation system where not only was it something that you downloaded uh, files to your computer, you also visited other people's computers. So it had this social aspect that you looked at other people's taste, you looked at what other people were listening to, what they had saved in their music folders. Uh, and then they, you, you could download and upload uh, files to, to, to and from the, the, the network. Uh, the problem was it, was it was a centralized system. So when the music industry in the form of people like Lars Ulrich from Metallica, when they came to, 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 to stop it, it was, it was quite a simple process to do. So it lasted maybe two years, 99 to, to 2001. Uh, but its impact was much more, which was much more far, far reaching because what happened was that people rethought what it was to, share files, what it was to, uh, uh, what ideas of copyright they were going to accept and they weren't going to accept. Uh, and it kind of built this network, this network of sharing, this network that was quite sociable uh, and moved, moved it, kind of made it much more accessible and public. We can see around the same time, artists like uh, Eva and Franco Matas did this project called life sharing and life sharing was, I think this was 2001 to 2003 uh, where they just made their computer public and you could, you could browse in through their computer and you could, you could look at the files, including their emails uh, and their bank files and all this kind of stuff where you became their, their machine became public and their life became public to the, to, to, to the vehicle of the internet. So already ideas of privacy, ideas of sharing, 
uh, and also the ideas of surveillance are coming into play. And this is around the year 2000. So these are very kind of important pertinent issues at the moment, but they have a long history. Uh, at the same time, we had, uh, uh, you know, issues of, of governmental surveillance with projects like uh, Echelon, which was a, a national security agency of the United States, uh, and they were already had this this keyword uh, sharing uh, system that would look for certain keywords uh, and then would tap people's phone lines and, uh, and tap people's computers in a very kind of globalized system. Uh, and this is like 2000. So this is this the history of what became, you know. I guess came to more prominence with Edward Snowden uh, and his revelations was already in existence even in those very early days of the internet when the internet is quite uh, quite kind of you know not quite yet mainstream. Uh, so this brings me just as a kind of a precursor to to BitTorrent. Uh, so BitTorrent. So let's drop share here. Uh, so BitTorrent was a sequel to Napster. Uh, it changed the way things were done because what stopped Napster was that it wasn't centralized. It, it, was, it was centralized. It, there was a computer you could shut down. There was a company you could target. Uh, BitTorrent became, it was a peer-to-peer, -peer, which meant that uh, everyone was part of the network. The network was formed from people who were its members. Uh, and also the BitTorrent protocol became this it was a very different creature in that it let you, it broke up files into very small pieces and let you download them uh, in the best kind of possible order. So you didn't have to wait for a whole file to be available. You could just download a bit of it. And once you downloaded even a small portion of that file, you would then upload it. So it made it, made it much faster and much more accessible to people who had like slow, slow internet connections. Uh, so what the BitTorrent, so to get on to the first work of the BitTorrent edition, what, what that does is it, it, it looked at a couple of TV shows that were being popularly downloaded. Uh, each of the shows was uh, at the time the most, the most kind of broke a record for the most downloaded TV show in the history of BitTorrent at that particular time. Uh, some of them were downloaded, it's like for example, a, the Breaking Bad one was downloaded a million times in 24 hours. Uh, the Game of Thrones episode was uh, shared by 160,000 people uh, in what they call a BitTorrent swarm. So 160,000 people were sharing the same file at the same time all over the world. So this became this vast uh, social phenomenon where people were, were sharing files uh, at, the peak of, at the peak of BitTorrent. 60, they say the estimates were say that 60 to 80% of all the bandwidth of the internet was devoted to BitTorrent. But it was this very secret, very hidden, very kind of uh, unknown network. Some people say it was part of the dark net, this kind of the, the net that is hidden from search engines, the net that is hidden from plain view. Uh, but it was this very social, very, very kind of uh, very strange social network that was being built around this idea of getting access to to information, getting access to images, getting access uh, and sharing uh, files of people or TV shows, mostly films, but lots of other things too that people wanted to see but didn't have a kind of a plain access to in their normal life. So they kind of resorted to an alternative an alternative economy of economy of circulation. Uh, to, to get access to these. Uh, today, this is more, more or less kind of been, uh, this need has been met by people like Netflix uh, and other streaming services. So the, the BitTorrent, BitTorrent traffic has fallen way down. It's, you know, maybe 3% of the internet now is BitTorrent, whereas something like Netflix would be 15%. And of course the internet is much bigger than it was at the time. Okay. So what I want to do is start by showing you some of these BitTorrent videos uh, to kind of see what I can. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, and I'm going to start with the first one in the series from 2011, which was uh, the Madman TV show. 
before I started, I just want to say, so, so the way I did these, 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 these videos were, was I downloaded uh, videos using BitTorrent, but I didn't complete the download. So what I did was I downloaded them partially so that the, the file was incomplete. Uh, and because the file was incomplete, uh, when I tried to play it in, in, in a video player, the, the codec that compresses the video gets confused. Uh, so first of all, the video has been downloaded with BitTorrent and what BitTorrent does is it breaks it into a whole of small pieces. Uh, normally around somewhere between a half a megabyte and a megabyte each. Uh, and these pieces are all downloaded as they become available. So it's kind of as fast, uh, as soon as they're there, they get, they get downloaded. And then as soon as you have them in your machine, you're also uploading them. So there's a back and forth, up and down stream of the files. And as they come together at the end, when you have all the pieces, then they get reassembled and the file uh, is a normal file. Uh, but if you interrupt that process, you have an incomplete, uh, you have an incomplete video that has pieces of the images are, are missing from the whole video. Uh, so then the video player, uh, that's, uh, that is essentially, it's a decoder, it decodes the compression algorithm that has made this video into a file. Uh, that then tries to put it together. And to put it together reveals how the glitches that you see and the errors that you see reveal how it was all put together in the first place, how the, how the actual algorithm works. Uh, so this is what you're seeing in this. This is a video. It, there's, no, there's no visual effects. There's, it hasn't been post-processed. It's just a very linear edit. Uh, so everything that happens, including the repetitions and all the glitches are in the original file and a result of the kind of the process of BitTorrent downloading. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll play portions of it uh, and then I'll play some portions of the other the videos and then we'll come back and we'll kind of look at what's happening in the videos and particularly look at kind of uh, how the images are being altered and the visual effects that you're seeing, where they come from uh, and what, what's, what's involved in, in, in what you're seeing. Okay, so. Kano, are you showing the video on the right monitor? I don't think I can see anything on the screen. Okay, hang on a sec. Okay, I'm not sure. Hang on a sec. I'm going to stop that share and try to share it again. Hmm. Oh, yeah. No work. Okay, yeah, I must have been sharing different. Okay, so let's. So here we are again. I uh, uh, kind of. Okay. So one of the things you, you'll see in the videos is this kind of repetition where the same scene gets repeated again and again. Uh, and then the, the parts where the images start to break down. And we get this temporal shift where scenes from different places start to appear. So we can see the kind of the strict linearity of the video has started to break down. Uh, but we also see this kind of very almost painterly effect where the images start to blend uh, and the edges become soft and we kind of see uh, things almost melting on screen where, where the kind of the, the, the clarity of the image becomes, gets lost completely. And even though we, we, we can know that it's a referring to something, we, we can kind of see it becomes this much more abstracted image.
uh, and scenes play into each other where we have one scene and then the, the next scene or the previous scene starts playing over in the same in the same place. Okay. I'll just move a little further on. And we see this scene here where the actual image has been almost lost. We're, we're seeing just a kind of an abstractish, uh, very soft kind of painterly image. Uh, but it still has this glitch where things are jumping to the front uh, and there's this kind of juxtaposition between the, the, the current scene and then other places in the same, in the same video. We'll just stop that and get out of that one. So what's really kind of interesting about this is that the, the effects that you're seeing are very much dependent uh, on the, the, the process. They're, 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 they're completely contingent on how many people were downloading the video at the time, uh, what computer you're actually playing it back on, uh, what it's dependent on the BitTorrent a protocol itself, the way that the file is actually being downloaded, how many people are sharing it, what parts they're sharing, all the all these kind of uh, variables feed into it, as well as the codec that compresses the video itself that, that actually makes it makes it possible to share these videos in the first place on the internet because it, it, they, they're essential to make the file uh, small enough that it becomes you know feasible to share it on the internet because uh, a couple of years previously, this, this was not, not something that was possible. Uh, and these codecs are very similar to say the codecs are used in JPEG that make images small enough that they can be shared or they can be put up on the internet in, in ways that, you know, with, with limited bandwidth that it's possible to actually view them. It also makes it possible to stream videos. We can't, we couldn't stream them if they're, you know, if they're 20 gigabytes or something like that. It's just, just not possible. Uh, I'm going to just exit this video and maybe go into one of the others. And what I'll do is I'll just play one of the others uh, and just maybe mute it so I can talk over it a bit at the same time. So this was the season finale of, uh, of Breaking Bad, or uh, the, the, the series finale of Breaking Bad, the very last episode they had. It, again, it broke records for the amount of people who downloaded it at the same time. It was like a million people had downloaded this in under 24 hours. Uh, certain geographical areas were more, uh, it was more significant than others. In Australia, uh, downloading BitTorrent was always kind of ruled, ruled they, they led the way, they led the world in, in, in sharing, presumably because it was very hard to get these TV shows on terrestrial TV or any other kind of way to get them in Australia. So the only way they were going to be able to see these things was to actually to, to download them themselves. Uh, so what we're seeing here is, is kind of interesting. First, the video, the BitTorrent is, is, is being broken up into lots of small pieces. And these pieces are being downloaded in different ways, in different orders, depending on their availability. And as people download them, they also upload them. Interestingly, in the, in, in the system, we see that the, the more people who are, who are sharing them, the more kind of visually appealing and the more aesthetic the results are. That we see these kind of, these very kind of painterly effects are more prevalent when the, the file has been shared by more people. Whereas if the file has been shared by only a few people, we see a much more kind of blocky kind of, uh, not very appealing, kind of blocky, just glitchy effect. Uh, so what's happening with this is that in a video compression, say if these videos are, I think, MPEG-4 videos, and that's just a way of compressing those videos that analyzes them in a certain way uh, uh, to make them to make them smaller so that they they can actually be be, be uh, they can actually be 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 shown in all sorts of different ways rather than the, the, the full resolution of the videos. Uh, so what it does is it breaks them into what they call I-frames, P-frames, and B-frames. Uh, 
Uh, so iframes or, or intraframes are, are basically JPEGs. So they're, they're kind of the whole scene. They're a full image of the whole scene and they're quite large. Uh, they don't require other, they don't require, they don't relate to any other frame in the video. They're just an image on their own. Uh, and they kind of, they, they, they contain the whole scene. And then P frames are, are progressive frames. They just store the difference between the previous frame and the current frame. So if there's a change, they just record that change. Uh, so what you see, certainly when you see these kind of movements, you see things that are just a change and they become overlaid over the wrong background. So that's kind of some of the things you're seeing. And then the final type of frame is a B frame. And a B frame, again, is, is, is a measurement of the change in the video, what has happened from one image to another video image, uh, but they go backwards and forwards. So they, they have a, a kind of a, a different, different temporality. They can, they can refer to the, to the frames before, or they can refer to the frames afterwards, which makes them much harder to decode. And then the other thing that happens in a video is that everything that's the smallest unit of encoding that video is called a macro block. And a macro block is like 16 by 16 pixels. So it's quite small. Uh, and that's the kind of the unit. So everything gets encoded in these small blocks. Uh, uh, so what happens was then that the, the codec looks at it, it, it analyzes it in certain ways, and it discards frequencies over a certain, certain, uh, a certain uh, limit. Uh, so it makes the image much smaller by taking out information, by, by, like it, by taking things out that it doesn't think that you can notice or you can see so that we get a good kind of representation of what it is, but at the same time, it's not quite so, it's not quite so uh, smooth as it once was. Uh, so then how does this explain what we're seeing? So we see things like, you know, when, when things suddenly jump into full view, we get this kind of jumping effect. That happens when the encoder gets a complete iframe. So it gets the full background and kind of jumps up. Uh, but also sometimes you'll see the foreground of the next scene overlaid on the background of the last scene. So we're seeing kind of bits from one scene go on to a, another scene. And this is because it suddenly got this piece and it's saying, okay, we've got this piece and we, 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 can, we can encode it in this way. The, the jumping, the repetitive kind of ticking where things just go back and back and forth all the time, that's just the encoders trying to, it, it doesn't have enough information but these things are quite smart. So it's looking at what it's got and it's trying to put together the images best. And so rather than leave a blank screen, it just kind of fits in by repeating maybe a previous scene or repeating the scene that's just coming down the line. Uh, so it's kind of working hard to, to make these things, to, to make things happen and to give you something to see. Uh, but I think the really interesting bit here is, is that, you know, that the more people who are actually sharing it, uh, the better those effects are because the, uh, the the pieces are coming in a more interesting way. I'm going to stop this again. Uh, and the other thing is that there there are a way of visualizing for, and this is very interesting for me. Very visualizing this huge kind of hidden network of people sharing, of people going to great effort to bring these to bring the, there's a whole economy of putting these files online of sharing them. Uh, there's people who are kind of, you know, I think the, a lot of these shows will be shown on a Sunday night and a Monday morning, the files will be already up and people will be sharing them. So there's a whole kind of uh, network that's forming and it's hidden in plain sight. And it's a, it's a major endeavor of how people were, were using the internet, but it was something that couldn't really be spoken of and, and wasn't kind of part of the official internet. It was kind of the unofficial uh, background to what was going on. Uh, and I mean, this also feeds in with, you know, say glitch art, for example, glitch art are, are, are about looking at that kind of the error in the digital, the, the, the flaws in the image, rather than this kind of perception that we get of, of digital images being kind of perfect or, or sometimes too perfect. We, we get this kind of uncovering and excavating the errors and, and the, the kind of the problems with the files themselves. And in glitch art, there's, I guess, two, two ways of thinking about it. One is that we, we think about it in terms of uh, uh, tools that can kind of produce a really good visual effect. Uh, and there's a lot of data moshing and glitching tools that can do that. Uh, but what I was interested in, this was much more kind of the authentic file. 
uh, so that the, 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 the glitches that you see were the result of a, a kind of a, a process of the codec, a process of, of, of the systems that were being used to share. Uh, so it's kind of a visualization rather than something that I was deliberately going out to kind of achieve certain effects. Uh, at the same time, I was like, I, 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 so I realized that once, you know, if you were sharing, if you were working with a file that would be shared by more people, the visual effects were, were better. But it wasn't about that kind of glitching for the sake of glitching, just per se. So this is this was a bit torrent. So this is kind of ten years ago. I was doing this. It was very much kind of a social phenomenon of the time, uh, but it then it kind of died off. Uh, it did cause this change in the way that we we, we circulate images. Uh, this was the kind of the unofficial demand to be able to share images and to share videos and to share you know content anytime we wanted to, and you know. I guess capitalism uh, worked with that, and it started. It, it's it, it met the need, and as the internet became faster and more widely dispersed, people were able to work in streaming streaming systems, streaming uh, services, and this has pretty much died out. Though it still exists, and it's still like a valid way of kind of sharing files. So what I want to do now is maybe move on to. Uh, the second project, which is 24 Hour Social. Uh, and that was a, a project that looked at Vine. And Vine was, for me, a very interesting social network. It was, if you remember, it, it, it was a six second streaming or a six second looping video. So as a social network, when it first started, you could only uh, do it on your phone. There was no editing. There was very, or very limited editing. I think you could do six edits. Uh, it was six seconds long and it would loop and you could only make it with your phone. So when I first came across it, it was, it was what I was thinking was, you know, how would anyone ever make a video that was six seconds long? It was so limited in its format and it was so limited in the, the ability to, you know, you couldn't use other people's files, you couldn't upload files, you had to make them natively in the phone itself. Uh, and then it was also, there was no way, there was very limited ways to save it. So it was kind of a, an always on kind of stream of videos being made that just, if you didn't see them straight away, it was very hard to come back to them. So it was this kind of very temporal, very much fast moving flow. Uh, but what was happening was that the videos were actually really good. There was a lot of kind of innovation. People were being quite clever with what they were doing and they were making very entertaining videos. Uh, what I'll do now is maybe just show a few of those before I kind of talk into the. Uh, so this is kind of when I came to Vine, this was the kind of videos that were being made. And I'll just show a couple, a couple of them very quickly of kind of good examples of kind of what was going on with. Turn up the. Okay, so again with the audio. So, and this was one of the most famous videos from Vine of the, the early period. do it for the vine and uh, but also it had a kind of more serious aspect to it as well this is from ferguson and the kind of the ferguson protests of and this is the 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 militarized police force coming in threatening people uh, and vine was very important in that kind of early black lives matter protests uh, as a kind of a tool of documentation and then there was kind of formal. No, sorry, wrong one. Formal exercises in the loop. They took advantage of, of the, 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 the whole setup and the, the fact that the, the affordances of the system itself that it was actually talking about it. 
uh, who is a loop in video. Uh, so there was a kind of a lot of innovation, a lot of interesting things happening. Oh yeah, and there was also kind of like just. So there was a lot of twerking around at that time. Uh, so one thing that interested me about this was that it was the first social network that didn't have an API. Uh, so what that is, that there was no way to get at the data. So once you made, once you signed up to Vine and you made videos, those videos were automatically the property of Vine. And there was no way to share that information, to share that data. As social networks at that point always had, they always have an API, they always have some way that you can reuse that information, you can reuse the data. Uh, but Vine didn't have that. So once you've kind of signed up to Vine, you could make Vines, you could share them, but then everything that you did was what was it was basically belonged to to vine uh, and that was kind of uh interesting for me because it certainly had it was the sign that you know that that this was something new there was something else going on it wasn't just about the social the social network aspect of it it seemed to be the first very plain way that, that this system was being set up in order to collect data on its users. So it was what Shoshana Zaboff would call, you know, it was, a, it was a channel for the collection of behavioral surplus, this idea that uh, anything that can be collected about a user of a social network is uh, what she calls behavioral surplus, and, and that there's a value that accrues to, to the people who have made that platform. Uh, so this is a, an image just showing you some of the permissions of Vine. Uh, and this is what you sign up when you when you use it. You sign up to kind of to 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 give them this information. Again. Sorry, let's make it a bit larger. Yeah, and so a lot of it. This is kind of very standard stuff. You're going to do this for everything else. It's your you know it, it can look at accounts in your phone. It can look what else you have in your phone. It can look at your contacts. It can do certain things like record videos, use your microphone, uh, but it can also do things like this, device ID and call information. So it can read the, the device ID of your, device, of your phone. And a device ID is a really kind of important idea uh, in kind of surveillance capitalism. Uh, because whereas cookies can be, you know, on your computer, they can, they can be attached to, you know, a browser that you're using, web pages that you use, and they can track you in that way. A device ID is much more totalizing in that once you have a device, a phone, it records, it, it, it attaches that device to everything you do. So every app you're using, it, 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 it tracks your location. It gets everything that comes through that device gets recorded. And then this becomes part of what it is that the, the, that the platform is actually doing. So what it was doing, it was, it was collecting information about its user. And in turn, uh, you'd get to make Vine videos. And, you know, it was kind of a, in some ways, it was a, uh, maybe, maybe it was a good bargain. Maybe it wasn't. It's hard to know. But it was, it was definitely a Faustian bargain that you were making. And there is that idea that when we're talking about uh, uh, social networks, that, you know, if, if something is free, you are the product. Uh, our... Shoshana Zaboff would say, you're not actually even the product, you're not even the product, you are kind of the raw material that makes the product, but the product is uh, predictions that the company makes about you. Uh, so what I did was, uh, I'm going to actually switch now, I'm going to stop the share here, and can I switch the share to the other computer I have, and I'm going to set that one up. Okay, so so what I did was uh, uh, I decided I would I would download a day of videos from Vine. So what I would do is I, I would appropriate their content that they were appropriating from other people. Uh, uh, so what I set myself a task was to download a, a video for every second of the day. So eighty six thousand four hundred videos in total would be shown. In fact, I, I downloaded a lot more because I wanted to have more than one uh, video for every, or every second a day to have some choice. 
So I've made them into, so this is an example of, this is a folder which has, I think, yeah, I think this has a full day of, of, of videos in it. Uh, we can kind of randomly play some of them. Uh, and you can kind of see the elaborate things that people are setting up. The other thing I might, might say that there was, uh, these videos are kind of unedited. Uh, I don't, I haven't seen them all. So if you see something that you can't unsee, you can't unsee it. It's kind of a, a wild mixture of. Connor, we have some uh, audio feedback, I guess, because okay. of the second computer. So what I'm going to do. Okay, I'll stop the share for a second. I, I, I will. I think I have the, because I have the audio on two computers. Uh, so this, this is what I got. So I got this vast database of Vine, one for every second of the day. I assembled it into a, uh, assembled it into a, a program that would play them back for a full day. So it's called 24 hour Vine because it will play 24 hours of Vine uh, where the time that you watch it, uh, the videos you will see at the particular time you watch it, uh, will be made at, the, at that particular moment within a six second uh, tolerance. Uh, so again, as if you think of something like the clock where it's showing you like things that refer to the time of the day for 24 hours, this is kind of like a social media version of that where it plays for 24 hours, but everything you're seeing is coming from that moment that you're actually watching it. Uh, but the choice is always, it's, it's, it's a random system. So it randomly, there's an algorithm that chooses one. It has to come from those particular window of time. But in many cases, there's, there's many choices available. So it doesn't, uh, uh, it's unpredictable what comes up. Uh, and the idea is that they, they keep playing all day and, and videos, once they play once, they just stop, but they don't go away. So the, the next video will be painted over it and over it. And after the end of, you know, when it's been running for a couple of hours, you get this vast uh, accumulation of video, which kind of gives you the sense uh, of the, 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 the deluge of, of information of images that are coming at you in just this social network, but in all other social networks too. So what I want to do is go back to sharing my screen here. What I'm going to try and do, and this is a little experimental, it may not work so well. I'm going to try and run that locally on this computer. Uh, so what it'll do is it'll run live. Uh, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of computing power, which is why I have it on a separate computer. Uh, so it may crash, it may not crash. And normally when I run this as, as a, in a gallery, I have a dedicated computer that just does it. It's a very fast computer. And, and it do, all it ever does is just run this. So I'm gonna try it now by sharing screen again. Uh, it's made in processing. So this is processing. It's a, a kind of a, a visual programming or uh, that's particularly used by artists is particularly artist friendly and that it's not so difficult to code. Uh, and I'm gonna try, so it's running from an external drive which makes it a little bit more complicated. And I'm gonna press the start. Thank 
Go. Keep going. Go. Put it in your mouth. Chin. <laughs> Old McBaby has a farm. With a goat here. Ugly ass chickens here. My sister is too good. Yo, I'm about. working out and I'm playing my Jackson. <laughs> Smack him. You better get your black bracelet back, ugly ass out of here. Dark, bad motherfucker. Yo, what you asking for this? So my microwave is being possessed by Satan. Bagel boys. Even though I'm bagel boys. I'm done with bagel boys with cream cheese. Why are you scared? Oh, so much fun. Just kidding. It sucks. How do we cheat? Stay fearless. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna stop it. Yeah, I'm gonna stop it there. Can you hear me here? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I, I'll stop it there, and, and that gives you an idea. This keeps running for 24 hours. Uh, okay, now I'm on mute. Uh, so this keeps running for 24 hours. Uh, what, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, yeah, so keeps running for 24 hours. Uh, what, what I've done was when I, when I bring in all the, I bring in all the files. It's I'm also getting so. First of all, maybe a little bit about how I got it because one of the things because there was no API, there's no legitimate way or there's no easy way to get at these videos. So these videos are pretty much locked up. Uh, but because Vine was owned by Twitter, uh, they 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 tweeted they automatically tweeted all the videos. So by going to Twitter and Twitter has an API, I was able to kind of find a backdoor to get at stuff. And most things, if you put stuff up on the internet, everything can be scraped through a process of web scraping. More or less, you can get anything that's on the internet and you can download it in an automatic way. Uh, so what I did was I went to Twitter. I found that you know every Vine video had the same part. They all had different URLs, but they all had this thing, vine.co forward slash V in them. Uh, so what I was able to do was then just put this into a scraper and be able to download everything from that. So when I, I did that, I, I would get this information. So I'm gonna just share my screen again here. So for every, for every tweet that you do, uh, you get a whole lot of information, normally about kind of 200 lines, uh, maybe about 80 different uh, fields of information about the, every tweet and about the person who made that tweet. Uh, so, and it looks a bit like this. It is actually, it looks exactly like this because this is one. Uh, it, gets, it starts off with, you know, IDs, information about the tweet. Uh, it goes, you know, whether it's retweeted, uh, its address, who it's from, all this kind of stuff. And then it gets down to uh, the user itself. So this bit here is the user. So this is about the person who made who tweeted this tweet, which you know, contained the vine as well. Uh, it has also the information about you know how many followers you have, simple things like profile, background, color, stuff about what's actually happening in the thing, but also has stuff like location. So it has like place. This one's from Chicago. It has this bounding box, which is a polygon. This is a geofence polygon. So these are longitude and latitude, uh, but it hasn't placed you precisely because this, so this is someone who didn't, who doesn't have uh, their tweets geotagged. So they're not giving you a precise longitude and latitude. And, you know, from the early days, Twitter would always like this, but they don't, they, people didn't go for it. People didn't want to add a specific longitude and latitude to every tweet they did. So they started working on places. What they do is they'd average you to a certain place and they put you in a geofence, which is a kind of a small geographical area. And this makes that tweet more valuable because obviously they've got a location on you and so forth. 
And this goes on top of your, your device ID and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot more information beyond just what's in the tweet. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so you get you get the all this information with the tweet. And then if I switch to And then so this is some images of the of the project installed. And there's a green on red gallery here in Dublin. I'm gonna just yeah. So so what I do is alongside while I'm while I'm showing the images of the actual work itself, and these are playing live. Uh, I'm also syncing that up with the data that relates to each of those tweets. It never quite stays in sync because there's way more data. Uh, for every for every one of those videos, there's there's a lot more data involved. Uh, so we kind of would the two would face each other in this installation. They faced each other, uh, so that we're connecting that the fact that the image itself and the way the image is circulated is related to the data that is collected about the person who originally shared that image or who made that image, uh, and that this whole system has been set up as a way of collecting data. And this is the reality of the internet today, uh, described so well by Shoshana Zaboff as a, a surveillance capitalism, uh, that the, the most social networks now are ways of, of uh, kind of gaining information about you, gaining information about your network. Uh, and someone like the Philosopher Bernard Stiegler would say that what's what's actually happening is it's the grammatization of the social network of the social relationship itself, in that it's an attempt to build a system to break down how we relate to other people. The kind of essential uh, thing of what it is to be human is is to relate to other people in, in the social ways, and to break that down in a way that it can become calculable, and that is a way that it can be fed into an algorithm and a way that it can be used to make predictions. Uh, and this is what kind of brought me to Vine, I guess, in, in, the, in the first place was that, first of all, it was, it, it was great fun. Vine was a super interesting place. Uh, the, the videos that were being made there were really powerful. They were entertaining. They were uh, so, much, so much to recommend them. Uh, but at the same time, it was we could, I could see that it was already being that the purpose of of the of the network was this kind of data collection exercise, uh, and I think there's an interesting parallel to be drawn or comparison between the two projects. Whereas with the BitTorrent, it was very much individuals were attempting to kind of uh, get us. Uh, content we could call it, but, but images and videos being made by someone else and they were attempting to get them to, to gain knowledge, to gain access to culture in ways that wasn't available to them in any other way. Uh, and we move on 10 years uh, and those things are, are not so important now because the real value of the internet uh, for the big internet companies is actually just to get people engaging with them in different ways. Uh, and in the way that people engage with them that they could, uh, that has been used to actually gain information, to build prediction project pro products, and then to feed that into algorithms, into machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence to try and figure out what it is uh, that you're gonna do next. Uh, and with a company, certainly the, the, the top end companies like Google, uh, it's almost to nudge your behavior. So the idea is to not only predict what you will do next, uh, but to feed you uh, information in certain ways uh, so as that they can actually kind of, with a, with a certain amount of certainty, uh, they can actually kind of nudge you into doing certain things uh, that are of interest to them and, and to their advertisers. And on that cheery note, uh, maybe I'll stop and we'll see if there any questions. Well, thank you so much, Connor. And while we wait for some questions to come in through the chat, um, I have a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, um, I think also one of I guess that um, Marco has 
some connection issues. Michael? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, now yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> well, you can, you can ask the proper questions if I get stuck by my bad internet today. No, I, I just wanted to say that I was interested in this idea that Connor mentioned about the relation between the uh, effects of the glitch in the BitTorrent trilogy and the amount of people who shared the files, this direct correlation between the circulation and the representation in the image. How does that really work exactly? Like I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. It's, it's hard to know precisely, but I think what, what's happening is because uh, there's more people sharing, the, the way that the, 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 the I guess the, the, the variety in the, the, the order of the pieces that are coming down is more, is more, it's more varied. You're getting pieces, like say if there's a, a thousand pieces of, of the video, you're getting them from all over the place. So you, there's no kind of, there's no logical order. You're getting lots of them so that there's more, uh, there's more gaps and those gaps are more evenly dispersed throughout the video. Because if, for example, there's, you've only got say 10% of the video, it just won't play. There's not enough for it to actually play. So it just says it's not a video. Uh, but if you're getting bits that are filled in and, and it, they're kind of evenly dispersed throughout, which is more likely when you have more people sharing them because more people are at different points in the video, different different stages of, of progression of the download. So you get you get more gaps, but those gaps are more evenly dis dispersed. So then the codec can actually fill them better. Uh, but in that filling, it, it's it's the, the the algorithmic filling. It's it's trying to make its best guess that that we get the kind of interesting visual effects. So it's a kind of a way, I guess, of, of tricking the algorithm into doing something that's more interesting rather than just starting at the beginning and kind of working down, which if there's less people, you're probably just going to have like the, the start of the video, maybe it will be better. And then the end will just cut off completely. But it's also interesting how it almost is a visual representation, almost like the frame to the person, right? Like each bit corresponds to a person in the network. So somehow I think there's an interesting metaphor there. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, um, let me bring you a question from D. Carey. I was I was also curious about the, the how similar Vine looks like, or like it, it feels more like a prequel of one of the most popular uh, media exchange platforms nowadays, which is TikTok. Yeah, uh, sure. it's like a quite. I mean, it's similar, but of course, Vine was quite much more uh, limited but on its visual features. And even also in its, uh, I would say, capitalistic features too, in the, in the sense of, or I don't know how much it has evolved in, in these two both uh, ways. How, how do you feel about it? I think, yeah, it's, uh, I think TikTok is very like Vine. It, it, it has, uh, it's definitely the successor to it, it, it in terms of, uh, I don't think they have the same time limit, but they're quite short at the same time. Uh, it has the same energy. I mean, what, what I liked about Vine, and we didn't see any when we watched it, but there's some crazy stuff in, in Vine. There's, there's stuff that's very elaborate, very kind of elaborate setups, a lot of work and creativity went in. But there's also a lot of kind of slice of life things that are very kind of uh, interesting, <laughs> very disturbing as well. So TikTok has, has all that stuff. I mean, it's, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of TikTok as well, though I don't make videos for it. And I never log in, and I've never formed, I've never had an account. Uh, but TikTok has also upped the the surveillance aspect. I mean, by all accounts, TikTok is, uh, is you know, ha has brought the surveillance of its users to a new height. <laughs> they've, they've, as well as the, the the platform itself, you know, the kind of the energy you're getting from the platform, the memes that run through it, very similar, very much a successor. And I think in terms of, you know, uh, as a platform for surveillance, they're following definitely in the footsteps of, of what Vine did and what Vine, I think, were kind of one of the first to be very blatant about it. They didn't pretend that they were going to share. Because, you know, when we, we think about Twitter, Twitter started. And when Twitter started, they said, you know, we're going to share all this information with everyone. 
everyone will have full access to everything. And then they cut it bit by bit by bit by bit. So essentially, you know, Twitter has access to Twitter. Uh, and uh, if you want to buy Twitter data, you have to buy through Twitter company that just sells that data. Uh, and they kind of cut off all external parties little by little to a thousand cuts. Uh, but they were always still pretending that, you know, Twitter is a community. Twitter is like everyone's, you know, Twitter data is for everyone. Whereas Vine never really said that. They just said, you know, that's, <laughs> that's what, that's, we own your data and, and we will monetize your data in, in any way that we see fit. Yeah. Um, I have a comment from Angel in the chat. I'm just going to read it. Um, so we saw some of these AI field images last week when speaking with Mario Santa Maria in the event he did for the festival live streaming. Um, in that case, in relation to the Google Arts and Culture project and for copyright issues. So when navigating museum in sort of street view style. Uh, so this is the, the images that get selectively blurred for copyright reasons. Yeah. Uh, it is interesting to see the software manifesting its workings that way. And as Connor mentioned, at times the too dramatic effect. Now, in this case, the copyright issue is peer-to-peer -peer driven, and it's the user who breaks usually that copyright law. Yeah. So what is the rebellion against the monetization of our data? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good point because this 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 work is quite, uh, I mean, I think issues of copyright are, you know, they, they, they're not so important anymore. People, you know, they, the corporations don't worry about people infringing their copyright. Uh, when we think about Google and Google, you know, when Google started scanning books uh, and there was this idea that they, they were attempting to steal the copyright of the authors of the books. Uh, and what, what happened in the end was we, what we found out was that Google were actually, they weren't so concerned about the copyright, but what they were doing is they're using it to train their artificial intelligence. Uh, so I think, you know, the idea of generated images uh, and what data has been used and how it's been used to train AI is really important. And there is, I mean, there is a lot of work being done on that. And there's a lot of artists working on it, which I didn't get into because it's kind of, uh, it was beyond the scope of, of the talk today. But yeah, I mean, it, it, this is the important thing for today is how data has been used, how we can stop data being used in, in certain ways. Uh, and there's, a, there's an awful lot of work being done on that. I mean, my current work is all AI related. Uh, I've been, you know, working with, again, with Twitter. I, mean, I can't keep me away from Twitter. I've been working, I've been training. Uh, I, I had a project that trained uh, an AI using Twitter data from certain filter bubbles. Uh, I'm currently working on GAN work, gen generative adversarial networks, generating images. Uh, again, training them from data that's been particularly kind of biased. Uh, but that's the really big concern, I think, at the moment. Uh, but I think maybe some of these projects give it a kind of historical, almost perspective on, on how the kind of the, the the goalposts maybe move. They shift as 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 the technology advances. And and uh, do you see any relationship between the glitch aesthetics and like the popular uh, culture? Is there any? relationship in both because I was thinking also when looking at those glitches I could see some connection to Predator to the movie to the alien film this like moment in which the alien gets like uh, hidden I don't know if uh, you think that uh, like all these uh, glitches that came up with uh, with the BitTorrent uh, get some sort of like influence on on pop culture uh, I think I think yeah I mean I think the whole glitch there was there was a time when there was a whole glitch aesthetic. I mean, and I, I guess it really reflected what was happening in, in, in people's lives too. There was, you know, projects like this, but there was also this idea that, you know, if you were watching streaming images, if you were uh, speaking to people on, you know, kind of uh, video streaming services, you were always getting this glitch. So that the kind of the idea of the digital being this perfection, which was what, what it was presented at in the original, when it was first becoming kind of pervasive, was breaking down. So I think the glitch aesthetic has kind of permeated culture in, in very kind of deep ways. Uh, and I think we see it, we, we see it in lots of different aspects uh, of, you know, uh, 
of images of culture in, in movies and popular culture in different ways. But I think it's interesting that, that at the moment, you know, what's happening is like, and I guess maybe it's a reflection that, that connections are getting better. Uh, streaming is getting better. The technology, you know, Zoom is kind of uh, a good example of that, of, you know, how you can kind of stream so many people at the same time. Uh, that what's really kind of almost becoming more pertinent now is how do we detect what is real and what is generative, generated. And, you know, if you've ever seen that, you know, this person doesn't exist project uh, where they, they've actually generated, you know, really uh, convincing images uh, of people's faces. Uh, and it's very, it's very, it's very difficult to tell them apart from, uh, to, to actually discern that they are generated and not like real authentic images. So I think you're, there's a kind of a breaking down of the call in, in indexicality of images. Uh, and that was always, I think, somewhere in the digital image because once the digital image was uh, just, you know, the digital image is just a digital file. And we've been talking about, you know, moving data. Uh, so an image is just a, a data file, you know, and it doesn't really care what the content is. There's no semantic understanding of, of what it is that it's been carried. It's just a, a data that has a, a certain algorithmic process being, being, being carried out on it that renders an image. And now we're kind of moving into the age where those images can be just completely generated based on a kind of a previous information about what a certain image would look like. Uh, so it's kind of a, 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 a repetition of the past rather than something that is actually new. If that makes sense. Which I think yeah, it ties in with a question from Marcus that comes in. I think you partly answered it, but he's asking what's your opinion about the AI as artist trend. So maybe more in terms of uh, um, the role of the artist and the uh, algorithm in that sense. Maybe you can elaborate a bit. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's, yeah, I think we're kind of uh, almost in dangerous territories in some ways because uh, AI tools, you know, when you're working with machine learning and, you know, some, some of the tools that are available are really very powerful. <laughs> you can do all sorts of, uh, lots of interesting fun things with them. Uh, but there is always a danger, I think, when artists work with the, you know, it's the whole idea of art washing, that when, when artists work with powerful technologies, uh, they have to be really careful uh, about keeping a critical edge because otherwise it becomes a way of kind of normalizing what those technologies can do. Uh, and with AI, I think that's really important that uh, we kind of find, we, 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 we kind of intervene in a way that is critical and that we point out that there's, you know, there is problems with the way uh, AI is being operated. There's problems in the assumptions that it's making. There's huge problems of bias uh, that are being hard coded into these systems. And there's been a lot of work being done on that. That's kind of, uh, I'm thinking of Trevor Paglin's work with, you know, uh, the image training sets uh, that has kind of exposed some of the kind of the bias and the way that these things are problematic. So I think it's, there, there is a huge role for artists to kind of visually intervene, uh, particularly in things like image recognition and image generation. Uh, but it's a, it, is, it is also a dangerous territory. That it's very easy to get sucked into uh, working with really powerful tools uh, in a way that you know maybe isn't as critical as it could be. There's another thing that struck me um, in your presentation when you were talking about Vine. You mentioned something about trying to sync data and images, and always somehow uh, failing to do so because the data is taking too long compared to a six second video. Mm -hmm. um, it made me think a little bit on the role, like uh, how much also this, this image from static to moving image has been offered on different platforms in different lengths. And somehow I wonder if, you know, like uh, with all these things that we 
just talked about about sort of surveillance capitalism. Uh, what is the the perfect ratio somehow, right? Like if the we want the image to be as small as possible and the data to be as big as possible, or somehow if there's a magic formula for the relationship between the two. And if we think of like TikTok length uh, versus uh, I don't know uh, Instagram static, I don't know <laughs> if there's something there. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I can, I can imagine that the, the length of the data that comes from a TikTok is pretty, pretty vast. Uh, but it, it, yeah, it, it is, it's an interesting point, though, because the, there's something you know, that seems, uh, I, I think one thing about TikTok, say, and Vines, they seem so ephemeral, even the way they're presented, that, you know, you scroll down, it's very hard to get back to one if you miss it. So it's very much they're, they're there and they're gone. So, you know, it kind of, you feel if you're making these videos, you feel, well, I can make this video and no one will ever see it again who didn't see it in that kind of very short two minute window uh, when it was first shown. And of course, I mean, the thing we know about the internet is nothing is forgotten. Everything is saved, no matter how trivial, everything can be saved, everything can be monetized. Uh, the kind of the volume volume of data is, is always going to be is always better. The more you can collect, the more it can be used. The deeper the insights, the the more granular the the kind of the model they can they can make. Uh, so there is something very interesting between the you know the the notion of ephemerality, which I really like that the notion that things are there and then they're forgotten, uh, and that you know a very short video can be, you know. Uh, so so engaging and then it's just lost in time <laughs> nothing nothing is everything is recorded everything is categorized everything is you know everything adds into your permanent record so to speak in this day this there's no way to there's no way that anything ever gets forgotten absolutely um i just wanted to um, fish from the chat a couple of comments that we <laughs> I mean there's Geraldine and I think which Geraldine it is who wrote the only good thing that Google has done is copyright infringement <laughs> <laughs> related to the previous <laughs> and just uh, on the side make sure that um, you check Geraldine where it's next um, upcoming a stream on Sunday at the uh, for the festival and in collaboration with situations there's a little plug there um what else angel is saying that now we know why connor is not on facebook yes. <laughs> you want to comment on that are you have any thoughts on i used to be i used to be on facebook but yeah i think well uh, yeah facebook is the worst i definitely feel that but I, I i'm still on google i'm still on lots of these things i i uh, it's it's very it's very hard to not be on anything, isn't it? <laughs> and I I think also that's that's why I mean, what they say is that one of the one of the greatest tricks that uh, the devil plays, one of the greatest tricks that, that Silicon Valley ha has played on us, is to tell us that everything has to be exactly as it is, that if we want to have social media, that if we want to have mobile phones, if we want to kind of le lead a digital life. That we have to share we the, the the way it is now the model that they've generated is the only way to do this whereas that's really not true we can we can have all the things that we like about the digital uh, and we can also have uh, privacy and we can also have uh, systems that don't discriminate and that aren't racist uh, but it just needs to be it can't be the first thing they came up with so it's the kind of the idea of move thing, you know, move fast and break things. That that has been the model that the, that has stood them well, and they've built you know huge empires on that. But at the same time, you can't continue to break things. Uh, and I think we're we're coming to the point where enough people are realizing this, uh, and particularly with, with 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 machine learning and with AI, and when people start looking at how. AI has been trained and looking at the, the presumptions and the data that's being fed into us, uh, we're, we're seeing kind of problems that could be really hard coded into a lot of systems that are very, very important. You know, in the US, they've already kind of got sentencing systems uh, that are uh, being pretty conclusively proven to be racist. 
uh, and that they will deliver a much harsher sentence for a non-white person than a white person. Uh, but they're actually compulsory in, in some places for judges to use them because the assumptions that they built in to train this AI were that, you know, black people committed crimes. It was very, very, very basic errors made in them. Uh, so I think we're at that place and, and that's why I think it's really interesting uh, and that's moving into images very much at the moment, you know, image recognition, how image, how, you know, faces are being recognized, what predictions we can make from, from images and from faces. Uh, and that's, uh, and then when we move on to kind of generating images, again, we've got to look at, you know, how are these being trained? What are the, what are the predict, what are the presumptions that are fed into the way that things are being generated? from the images that they're, they're training them on. And uh, maybe just as a last question, in fact, there are two questions that are asking the same thing, both Angel and, and me, going back to the networks. And uh, uh, they are both asking about uh, alternative ethical networks uh, available, if there's any uh, option or any possibility that you can share. Uh, uh, in terms of social networks. Uh, yeah, going back to the, to, oh, to yeah. the idea of the social Oh, there were a few, I mean, weren't there? And yeah, like, the problem, I mean, yes, there could absolutely be ethical networks. The problem with them always has been is that you don't know anyone on them or none of your friends are on them. <laughs> so it's like, you know, your families. And uh, so how do, you, how do you move it to the point where enough people say we give up on Facebook or we give up on you know, Twitter, and move to something where all the same people will be there, but it will be much more ethical. Uh, so I think, you know, in terms of that, the real solution is is actual kind of regulation where, you know, the, the, biggest, the biggest digital companies have become too big, they need to be broken up. So, you know, would Facebook be as bad if the, the social network was separated from their AI, was separated from all the other, from WhatsApp, was separated from all the other things that they knew and would Google be so bad if, you know, search was separated from Gmail, was separated from data centers, was separated from Android. Uh, you know, as long as it's, it's, the, it's the connecting the dots, it's the, you know, it's the joining one thing to another to another to build these kind of big pictures. Uh, and I think that's where the problem lies. <laughs> but, So on that note, I think that it's uh, time to wrap up. Um, I want to thank once again, Connor, for this wonderful screen walk and for taking us through his projects and through this technology in a way that both combined very interesting technological, political, and visually relevant aspects. And thanks, of course, everyone of you who joined us in Zoom and joined us on Twitch. Um, I want to assure you that we are going to be back in two weeks because screen walks never stops. Um, in spite of the summer ahead, we're going to be joined by a bot photographer dealing with Google Street View, which we will unleash uh, uh, for a nice summer intermezzo in two weeks. So that is um, the 29th of July, two Wednesdays from now. Yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah, remember that uh, we will be having this uh, next screen walk, this automated screen walk in, in 15 days. And also remember that you have all the recordings of the of all the uh, screen walks that we have done so far, uh, and also a couple of performances that uh, we have hosted. 